Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Woodbridge, the best town around. I need you to follow me around the next year. I want to welcome everybody to this wonderful Avenel Performing Arts Center, something we opened up in 2019, like everything else was doing amazingly well until the pandemic hit and we're still recovering, but it's still a wonderful facility. And also Curtin's Restaurant next door, which same thing was doing great until uh, things got bad in uh, March of 2020. I'd like to introduce some of the elected officials in the audience. Uh, Sharon McAuliffe, First Ward Councilwoman. <clears throat> I see Howie Bauer, Council President, Second Ward Councilman. I see Corey Spiller, Third Ward Councilman. I feel like the lady in romper room. I see Viru Patel, Fourth Ward Councilman. <clears throat> Although I can pretty much guarantee you in the 60s, Nancy from romper room never said, I see Viru. I guarantee that. I guarantee that. We. We have Senator Bob Smith in the house. Our assembly speaker and our good friend Craig Coughlin was, was here for a little bit. He had to get up to Patterson to accept an award, so Craig Coughlin was here. <laughs> Former assemblyman uh, John Wisniewski is in the house. We have our town clerk in the front here, John Mitch. We have, the, from the Woodbridge Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, the Executive Director, Manny Zidius. And the, the Chamber President this year, Holly Church Doyle. We have members from the Woodbridge Redevelopment Agency, the Planning Board, the Zoning Board, the Housing Authority, the Affordable Housing Corporation, all the different entities that are here, uh, finding they're part of everything that goes on in Woodbridge Township, but they're here to support us. Let's hear for all those different entities. We have Heather LaMotta, who is the assistant to Carolyn Ehrlich and redevelopment. Let's hear it for Heather. <clears throat> and I'm very proud to introduce the people at the day, starting with my right arm, Carolyn Ehrlich, and my left arm, Marta Levsky. <clears throat> when it comes to economic development, there's no better team in the state of New Jersey than right here in Woodbridge. Marta is the planning director, has been for 30 years. Ish, 30 ish. And Carol was on the council when I was the CFO. We became very good friends, and then we went to Trenton together for four years under McGreevy and Cody, came back. I won mayor. She became chief of staff to uh, me as the mayor. And then I figured the most important job we have is economic development, so I put her in charge of the redevelopment agency. And these two do amazing work in the township of Woodbridge, and you're about to see that today, so thank you. I want to thank the team that put this terrific program together, starting with our communications director since we've been here, uh, John Haggerty. He is very ably, ably assisted by his assistant, Megan Kushba. And the staffers who helped put together this presentation and all the different uh, slides and everything. We have Kelly with an IE, Walsh. And we have Meredith Kushba. And we have Sam on the booth and uh, running the uh, video. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, who is Tim Sullivan from the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. I'm going to read a little bit of his bio. During his tenure, Tim has led the NJEDA's transformation into a comprehensive economic development organization dedicated to implementing Governor Phil Murphy's vision for a stronger and fairer New Jersey. Under his leadership, the NJEDA has led the development and implementation of more than 15 programs created under the Economic Recovery Act of 2020, provided more than $700 million in COVID-19 relief. And there you go. I said COVID-19. Carol said the first speech you're going to have in two and a half years where you don't have to mention COVID-19. And I said pandemic twice. I didn't say it in the beginning, <laughs> but there I, there I said it. COVID relief to small businesses impacted by the pandemic, facilitated the construction of the New Jersey wind port and growth of a robust offshore wind industry in New Jersey, collaborated with partners in the private sector to grow New Jersey's innovation ecosystem and help municipalities revitalize brownfields and other underused spaces into valuable community assets. And that's the part I know the most about. Ladies and gentlemen, it matters who's running EDA. It matters who's sitting in that seat because that entity is so valuable, not only to governments, but to businesses. And Tim has been there for a long time and has done an absolutely fabulous job. And when I talk to companies, 
inevitably we wind up talking about EDA and what EDA has that can help them as they decide to expand in Woodbridge or come to Woodbridge. And I really appreciate the job that he's done and he's made our job a whole lot easier. Ladies and gentlemen from the NGEDA, Tim Sullivan. Thank you. Golly, thank you, Mary. That might have been the nicest introduction I've ever gotten in my whole life. I'm going to call my mother and tell her about that. That's <laughs> It's an, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you sincerely for the kind words, but much more importantly, thank you for everything you're doing here in, in Woodbridge um, to make this such a great community. Um, I should confess at the outset, uh, I'm, I was born and raised in Bergen County. I know it's a sin to say what I'm about to say, but there's a town there called Woodridge, led by the able mayor and Senator Sarlo. And it's still what I, when I hear the, most of the letters in Woodridge, I get Woodridge. So if I, get, if I slip, it's just my Bergen County coming out. Nothing but, uh, but love for this great town. Um, it's, it's great to be here, Senator. See, Senator stood up, but Senator Smith was here a moment ago. <laughs> uh, great, uh, great to be with him, and this, I know the speaker was here, and so many elected officials here. You know, on behalf of Governor Murphy, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here to talk about a few things that we've got going on at the state level, and, and a few things that are going on in the economy I think are, are interesting and, and, and worth sharing. Um, you know, I think as we stand here tonight, you know, heading into late October of 2022, and God, time's flying, right? Um, New Jersey's economic momentum is, is really good and strong. It's not perfect. We're not everywhere we need to be on a whole variety of matters. And we've got a whole bunch of headwinds uh, cropping up in our face from things like inflation and supply chain challenges and you know, a ground war in Europe that I don't think anyone nine months ago would have had in their bingo card. But you know, despite those very real challenges and the, and the high likelihood of some, some choppy uh, you know, air ahead of us uh, you know, sort of at the macroeconomic level, New Jersey's economic momentum is really good. It's as good as it's been in, in a long time. Um, you can see that not just in, you know, me saying sort of happy, happy talk about it. You can see it in the numbers. You can see it in sort of the state's revenue numbers. You can see it in the amount of the, the health of the fiscal uh, picture for the state. They were, you know, making massive uh, investments in infrastructure, making massive investments in um, all the things we care about, but also things like the credit upgrade. You know, I'm 41 years old prior to this past summer. Uh, S&P had never upgraded New Jersey's credit in my lifetime. They've now done it twice in the last six months. We have led the, uh, been in the top five in the nation for GDP growth on a quarterly basis for the first time since uh, no one can find a, a comparison number. I don't want to say ever because I'm sure there's, there's data back in, you know, the, the, in the heyday of the 60s or 70s, but certainly since recent in modern, modern memory, uh, we've been in the top five and in the top 10 in GDP growth. We're back in the top 10 uh, for venture capital investment in the state of New Jersey. I'd rather, you know, Governor Murphy's a very competitive guy. I'm, I'm pretty competitive as well. We'd rather be number one. Uh, but I'd rather be ninth than 16th. Uh, that sure is helped number, rather be number one or number two. California's number one. They got a, they've got a pretty good head start on venture capital investment. But um, again, things are moving in the right direction on almost every measure you can find. Does that mean we are out of the woods? Does that mean we don't have real challenges? Does that mean we don't have real structural uh, challenges? Of course it does. Uh, of course it doesn't. Uh, but you know, as we stand here tonight, um, our momentum is incredibly good and strong. You see that too in, in, in major uh, investments that have been launched and major initiatives that have uh, been, un, uh, you know, um, you know, brought forward by Governor Murphy and our team. But you can also see it just in, in if you, you know, if you look at some of the stats, again around, I'd, I'd point to things uh, like job creation. Again, if you, depending on which critic you talk to on any given day, people are fleeing and jobs are fleeing, and you know it's never been worse. And I'm not sure what data set they're looking at because there's no data that, proves, that suggests that our census data suggests that our state's growing. We didn't lose a congressional seat like most other places in the Northeast. Uh, in the last 12 months, New Jersey grew private jo sector jobs at a faster rate than anywhere in the Northeast. Period. End of sentence. Number one in the Northeast. That includes Pennsylvania, which is often sort of held up as this beacon of who we ought to try to be. New Jersey's growing private sector jobs faster than any other state in the Northeast. Yeah, thank you. There you go. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty damn good. You can't be better than number one. Um, we'll try, but you can't be better than number one. Um, how do we keep that momentum up? And that's the most important thing I think, as we said, because again, there, there, there's pretty likely some choppy weather ahead. Um, you know, I'm not going to use the R word out loud, but there, people, everyone seems to think there's going to be some sort of R word. Um, and you know, I think we're as well positioned as you can be heading into you know choppy, choppy weather. Uh, for a variety of reasons, I think the top of the list is the, some of the major strategic commitments Governor Murphy's made in the last, you know, four and three quarters years uh, that I've had the privilege of being part of that team. Uh, to uh, on a few different themes, I just want to hit actually five themes pretty quickly, and I want to be brief because I want to hear the story of uh, celebration of success as well for Woodbridge as well. Um, so I'll try and be brief, but there's kind of five key themes I think that that were really 
focused on and, and, and trying to deliver on. One, recapturing our leadership position, uh, position in innovation. Uh, two, supporting small businesses. Three, economic security. I'll talk about what that means in a moment. Four, investing in our communities. And five, economic diversification. So innovation and, and um, innovation and entrepreneurship. The way you get durable job creation in any economy is having new young companies grow and scale from five or 10 people to 500 or 1,000 people to 5,000 or 10,000 people. That's been the New Jersey success story. This is, this is the success story of, uh, of any thriving economy. And particularly in our heyday, New Jersey kind of wrote the playbook on innovation-driven entrepreneurship. Companies like Johnson & Johnson, you know, other companies that make up our pharmaceutical industry, the things that happened at Bell Labs, Sarnoff Labs, things that fueled the American century of, of innovation-driven job creation. A lot of that happened in New Jersey. And we're still a hotbed of innovation. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the Middlesex County marketing campaign talking about the, the, this great county as a cradle of innovation is 100% right. But the reality is other places have copied our playbook and caught up with us a little bit. And maybe a couple of them have pulled a little bit ahead. Places like Boston and uh, Austin and California and New York City to a certain extent. Uh, some other pockets around the country. So what, we got to reclaim that leadership position in innovation and, and entrepreneurship. One of the things we're doing is the new Evergreen Fund um, the, uh, as part of the Economic Recovery Act. It's a $500 million public-private venture capital investment program designed to put us back in the top five in venture capital investment in the country. But we're also making physical investments. And no better example of that than what's going on in New Brunswick, the innovation hub that's going to be built uh, by Devco uh, and you know, is underway now, that's where the infrastructure work is underway now, that is going to be a hub, literally, that's why we're calling it that, although I think Chris is telling me we're calling it the Helix now, which stands for Health Something Life Sciences Exchange or something. But Chris will kill me for getting that wrong, but he's not here. So um, somebody tell Chris, everybody tell Chris I got it right. I didn't uh, cover for me. Um, but that's going to be bringing together principally Rutgers, who is making massive investments in translational research, bringing the med school downtown right next to the train station, uh, bringing together uh, Hackensack, bringing together the Art of Engineering, and the EVA, and the Princeton, all together with commercialization space, lab space, the kind of spaces that are going to create the next generation of great, primarily life sciences, but technology companies as well. That's the kind of hotbed and cradle of innovation we don't have in the state right now, and it's going to be located right here in Middlesex County in, in, in New Brunswick, and that's the kinds of investments we want to make in innovation and entrepreneurship. Second thing is uh, supporting small business. Uh, the mayor mentioned COVID, and I, I don't want to dwell on COVID either, but you know, that pandemic we had, which is hopefully over, or at least the worst of it's over, um, you know, was a gut punch to small businesses all around the country. That, and, and people want to make that about you know, shutdown orders and all that. It's mostly about consumer behavior. A lot of people stayed home. A lot of people chose not to eat in restaurants. A lot of people chose not to, to go out long after people were free to do so. And you know, EDA was one of the, the places that you know, Governor Murphy entrusted in the legislature. I've got to give huge credit to the speaker uh, for his leadership on this issue as well. In, you know, nearly uh, uh, between EDA, DCA, NJRA, a few other entities, nearly a billion dollars of both state and federal resources dedicated to direct small business relief. At, for, at one point, we were the third biggest state in the country on a gross basis for how much small business grant money had become, been made available. It was California, New York, and us, and each of them have economies that are uh, 20 and 10 times our size, I believe, is the current estimates for those numbers. So punching way above our weight. Um, but that's what's important, too, is thinking about what happens next. So hopefully the worst of the pandemic is well behind us, and hopefully the pandemic itself is behind us. Um, but small businesses went into the pandemic uh, in, in a lot of cases, you know, without a ton of resources to, to you know, greet the crisis, and certainly are coming out of it. You know, not everybody. Some, some places are doing okay, but most small businesses are still very much recovering from uh, from the pandemic. So Governor Murphy has allocated $150 million of state appropriation to small business direct support. That dwarfs by magnitude, or, you know, or by orders of magnitude, any prior administration's commitment to uh, direct small business relief through the EDA. Uh, we're running both grant programs and loan programs. We just had a program launched two weeks ago now called the Micro Business Loan Program, supporting our very smallest businesses. Uh, people with 10 and fewer employees. The smaller you are, the harder it is to access traditional you know, bank capital, traditional lending capital. Um, and 90% of the minority-owned uh, businesses in New Jersey are some form of micro-business. We're talking about targeting micro-businesses. We're talking about targeting you know, primarily black and Latino-owned, Asian-owned, uh, immigrant-owned businesses, small businesses. We get 2,000 applications for that program, so we're a little oversubscribed. We've got to figure that out. Um, but more than 50% of the applicants there, minority-owned businesses, a little more than 30% women-owned businesses, a little less than 2% veteran-owned business. I'd like to see that number a little higher, but that's about the percentage of <coughs> veteran-owned businesses we have in the state. 
So again, pushing hard on uh, an equitable and strong recovery for the small business sector. Another uh, theme we're really focused on, economic security. And this is, this is something that sort of pre-pandemic we didn't really talk about the right way. And I've got to give credit to folks like President Biden uh, and also Pre uh, Governor Murphy for resetting how we think about economic security and economic infrastructure as core to economic growth and economic development. Food security is a great example of that. Speaker Coughlin, again, a huge champion for this in our state. Uh, and, you know, obviously in, in partnership with Governor Murphy. Uh, we've run a program called Sustain and Serve, which started as a COVID response program, but we've carried it on, that takes federal relief dollars and buys food from restaurants that could sure as hell use the business, particularly in the peak of the crisis, and gives it to folks facing food insecurity. Win, 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 everywhere you look at it. We, talk, we have countless narratives of businesses that were able to stay open, add employees, add a shift, add a new line of business to support folks who needed a decent meal. Uh, and a, you know, a hot restaurant cooked meal uh, during, during the peak of the pandemic, that's continued on. We have a, a food security, excuse me, a food desert uh, tax uh, incentive program coming down the pike that's gonna help create new uh, grocery stores, new healthy, fresh food opportunities in, in food desert communities. We also have a big commitment to childcare. Again, something Speaker Coughlin has, has led the charge on in the legislature. Uh, we're about to roll out a new grant program to support childcare facility upgrades. Child care is economic infrastructure. We don't think about it the way you think about the heat and the power and the water. But if your child care system turns off all of a sudden, good luck getting people to show up for work. We saw that, myself included. I've got young kids in the child care system as well. If people don't have a place for their, their kids to go that's safe, that's clean, that's, that's affordable, the economy doesn't work right. And so we've got to support that key sector. So that's when we talk about economic security. By the way, those are almost, almost entirely small businesses as well. That's the kinds of things we're thinking about. The fourth thing I mentioned, and we're in a great example of it, is investing in strong communities. Hard to think of a community that's made smarter investments in itself uh, than Woodbridge. Um, things like transit-oriented development. Again, we're sitting here in this beautiful theater, which I'm sure is going to come roaring back as soon as the, you know, the pandemic's out of the rearview mirror, in this great mixed-use development, this great transit-oriented development sitting right next to a train station. That is, that is how Jersey has to develop. We are the densest state in the union. We're not going to make much new land. We're not going to plow under too many more farms. We're not going to plow under, you know, the pinelands or the, or, or the skylands or the highlands. It's, it's appropriate that we, we are pretty much out of land. We've got to smartly develop the land we have. That's things like brownfield redevelopment. We're just launching a new tax credit program. We'll launch probably in the early new year, but we've just approved the rules for it to support the remediation and redevelopment of brownfields. We love remediating brownfields that are transit-oriented development as well. We just launched to have the first approval for our historic property tax credit. We've got great examples of our sort of industrial past, beautiful architecture that with a little bit of love, a little bit of investment um, can, uh, can be brought back to life. The Lowe's Theater in Jersey City is going to be the first one, but we'll hopefully have countless examples of historically significant structures brought back to life. Prior to Governor Murphy signing the Economic Recovery Act, New Jersey was one of 11 states that did not have a state level property, uh, historic property tax credit. I have no idea why. It doesn't really matter now because it's fixed. But now we are in the pack of most of the states in the country that have an historic property tax credit. So we will have an opportunity to bring new life back to old structures. That's how you invest in strong community. That's how you invest in mixed use. That's how you invest in smart growth. And we've got a tremendous amount of resources um, that can, can do that and, and try and support transit-oriented development as well. I, EDA is not a direct part of it, but the announcement the governor made uh, a couple weeks ago um, uh, at Metro Park about new development there. That's the, we've got, you know, New Jersey Transit has its challenges, but compared to the whole rest of the world, it's, an, it's a rail infrastructure that most places would give their right arm for. It's a great set of development opportunities. Every single station along that line, whether it goes into New York or not, those lines, excuse me, um, is a smart growth opportunity waiting to happen. And so, you know, collectively across the Murphy administration, we're really focused on trying to drive uh, that smart growth agenda. The last thing I'll mention sort of thematically is economic diversification. In any scenario, you know, in, in any portfolio that you run, you want to be diversified, right? And that's true for an economy, that's true on a sector basis for economies. It is great that we have such a great financial services sector. It is great that we have a great pharma sector. It is great that we have a great tech sector, great manufacturing sector, it's kind of our bread and butter industries. That's really important, we've got to invest in those. The governor just rolled out last Monday a big investment in our manufacturing sector. We've also got to feed and grow the new sectors that are going to continue to diversify the economy. And just in the last five years under Governor Murphy's leadership, there's four or five really big sectors that were pretty much doing nothing, and it had no presence in New Jersey, that are poised to be outsized contributors to our economy. Cannabis is on that list. Sports betting is on that list, which is really a technology and a cybersecurity and a financial technology play 
It's also fun. You can bet on the Giants and the Jets or whatever, whatever, whatever you do to have fun on Sunday afternoons. That's cool. And I, by the way, I misunderstood that opportunity entirely. When I came back from Connecticut to my home state, oh, there's a Supreme Court case, and it looks like Mike Gable do sports betting. I was like, oh, fun, cool. We, you know, have a couple beers and you know, bet on the Mets. That'll be fun. Uh, and they were like, no, you dummy. This is about cybersecurity. This is about technology jobs. This is about odds making. If you want to be able to bet for whether you know Tom Brady's going to make it on third and three on the road with the wind blowing in his face, that's real time actuarial work. New Jersey's insurance and financial technology sector is poised to support that. And we've seen huge growth in sports betting, uh, film and television. We've got more people looking to build film studios in this great state, and we've got places to put them. That's a high class problem, but one where we've got a significant boom. Uh, happening in film and television, and I think we've only scratched the surface with, uh, with what's coming in terms of some studios, including some you know, great recent news, uh, uh, a couple of great pieces of recent news around here uh, with some major film studio development you know, being contemplated really all throughout the state, but particularly in the you know, northern and central parts of the state. The last one is clean energy and offshore wind. Uh, Senator Smith's here. Hard to think of a bigger champion of our clean energy and offshore wind economy than him. Uh, both in South Jersey, where we're building this New Jersey wind port, but all throughout the state. Offshore wind is poised to add tens of thousands of jobs to New Jersey's economy. You know, solar is a huge contributor to our economy. Who knows exactly what happens next with things like hydrogen, what's that, what that's going to mean. But clean energy, the clean energy transformation is critical for our environment, it's critical for our, our energy framework. It's also incredibly important as a job creation opportunity. So we have a whole slew of tools that we've rolled out to support all those sectors. Because again, yeah, offshore wind is going to uh, you know, be concentrated a bit in, in the south and along the shore. But it's really got huge statewide opportunities because it's going to create R&D jobs, it's going to create manufacturing jobs, it's going to support existing supply chain companies because we're talking about making each, each wind turbine has more components in it than a 747 jet engine. Okay, that's a lot for those of you scoring at home. Uh, that means that there are existing New Jersey manufacturers, it could be right here, it could be all throughout the state, they are going to have the opportunity to sell into these gigantic projects. One of the reasons that the governor was so committed and, 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 and insistent upon, insistent sounds too strong, really focused on and prioritized uh, making sure that we had grant money available to support our existing manufacturers. We just opened this new, or announced this new program last week. Get ready for this opportunity because there's a huge wave of projects, big infrastructure projects on the sort of the traditional infrastructure side, but also clean energy projects that are going to be huge opportunities for New Jersey manufacturers. We want to make sure they're, they're ready and that their workforces are ready. So we're providing grant funding to help them kind of up their game um, to do so, because that's a huge opportunity. Again, we, again, we think a big part of the economic uh, diversification uh, play. I've been told by every teacher, including my mother, that I speak too quickly, and I think I honored that tradition tonight. I apologize. <laughs> but I didn't have I limited a lot of time and a lot to get through. There's a ton going on. Uh, at the state level, and on behalf of Governor Murphy, just an honor to be here. Mayor, thank you again for having me, and thanks for uh, letting me talk for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. That was terrific. A couple of groups I didn't mention the first time around were the Wedco Seminar, and I forgot to thank the Wedco Board. There are several members of that board here today, so thank you all for being here. Also, there's a lot of our employees here that help make us the best town around, so I want to thank everybody. So we're gonna go through a little bit of a, a, a slideshow here. So we've clearly prioritized Main Street in this administration. This is an aerial view of it. On the right is just an idea Carol had. We're doing a taste of Main Street on November 5th where we're, we're actually gonna invite all the new apartment tenants to come down and meet at the Woodbridge Brewing Company, then work their way up and down Main Street, stop and get a sample of whatever it is they have to offer. And when you really see this, you'd, you'd come to the conclusion that we have a lot of restaurants on Main Street already. People don't know we have a Thai place, a Peruvian place, a uh, European place. Um, there's all kinds of things down on, on Main Street that are really very uh, attractive for uh, the downtown development. Upper Main Street, <clears throat> the first thing you used to see on the bottom right was that old karate store, which was the ugliest thing heading down Main Street. And you see this terrible looking building. And uh, we spoke with, I'll get into that. We spoke with the owners and she came in and agreed that it was time to upgrade and what you see in the main picture there is what it's going to look like. She's already rented uh, the third kiosk there to Bank of America. It's going to be a third store. It's going to be a kiosk, uh, personless transactions, use your card, get in, do whatever you want, your mortgage, your banking, anything else. Uh, and they've just rented out the one on the corner for a vision center. These things wouldn't happen unless we were doing downtown, unless we were bringing people downtown with money, 
project like, projects like this would not happen. This is one of our favorite ones, the old Woodbridge National Bank building is going to be Strickland Steakhouse. Now, one of the things that's really hard about this job is recruiting new businesses. So three times, Carol and I had to go to Staten Island and visit the West Shore Inn. Three times we went for steak dinners and a few drinks and maybe dessert. It was, it's cumbersome, it's burdensome, but we finally convinced the owner, Mike Strickland, uh, by, by, by the way, it was voted best steakhouse on Staten Island. We finally convinced Mike to come to Woodbridge where he lives and where he was raised and where he has his three kids. And he is going to open up his second steakhouse. It's gonna be called Strickland Steakhouse in that bank building. That is gonna be so important to downtown that we have a steakhouse. Uh, Sharon actually gave us the idea. She knew him from the bagel shop and we're absolutely thrilled that he is coming to town and we're probably looking at an early 2023 opening. Speaking of Sharon, the iconic Not Just Bagels is taking over that uh, not so great looking building on the left there and she's bringing back Not Just Bagels to Woodbridge Township. <clears throat> but her first priority is getting elected in 15 uh, days. That's much more important. <laughs> The gallery on Main is, is our art gallery, and we think it's so nice to have this downtown. It just gives it a feeling of just being a nice downtown with an art. I mean, not every town has an art gallery. Ours is terrific. The artists love it. It's doing a great business. They had an artist reception last week and sold 17 pieces. It's just doing incredibly well. Across from Town Hall, we have the Madeira project. It's pretty huge. Um, actually, as it was going up, I was more worried about it. I was actually scared it was too big, but the more they developed it and finished the facade, the better it kind of fit in. Uh, right now, we're looking to fill the um, 6,000 square feet of retail space below it. And once again, we had to travel to Boboken. We traveled again to Staten Island as we're recruiting restaurants. We want a restaurant there, at least one, and that, that's our main priority, but that's a beautiful, beautiful downtown project. The former Riffy site, is now uh, Avenue and Green. You see on the right the demolition of Riffey's. There was uh, not much to write home about. And now it's that beautiful spot on the left. It has Eric Grant's coffee house. You have no idea what it, was, what it means to us to have our very first downtown apartment building retail space to be taken by Eric Grant's coffee house. The place is an instant success. He's a national name. Everybody goes there. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. And now it's filling up with some other uh, different retail spots also. That has spurred the development of the apartment complexes right next to it. There's two across the street on Clare Avenue. There's one right behind it on Rahway Avenue. They're not the best in the world, but there's somebody came in and bought all three and now is renovating them. So where they used to get $1,200 in rent, now they can get $1,600. Where they got $1,500, now they can get $2,000 because of what's happening all around downtown that's where the apartments can go anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000. We love the Stern Towers project. On the left was a 55 unit senior housing complex from the 60s. The last thing you would do if you were building a downtown is put 60 uh, senior units a block from the train station. It just makes no sense at all, but it was done. Bob Paulus and Wick companies came in. They built the new um, Red Oak, we'll see in a minute, the Red Oak Senior Housing Building in Port Reading moved the people from Stern Towers over to there, knocked down Stern Towers and built this beautiful building, the park in downtown Woodbridge. Uh, it's got a rooftop bar, it's over half rented already, and they've only just opened it in, uh, six weeks ago. The old brass bucket became a beautiful kidney center. That was also Detours Restaurant and Cross Oat Roads and a bunch of other things that went through there. But now, other than Breast Bucket, this sets a record for the longest uh, business to be there. Vermella, on the left, you see a couple old buildings and some solar panels on very valuable property in Upper Main Street. Vermella came in, it's the Russo development, and they've done a fantastic job developing that into 376 apartments with another 124 in phase two right around the corner. It's absolutely terrific. Each one of these complexes had its, has its own unique characteristics. Uh, this one has an outside barbecue, a dog run, uh, a pool. Uh, they all have good amenities inside. Many have gyms. It's really working out well. A big announcement tonight, the bottom left is an artist drawing of what Angelina's Kitchen 
might look like. They signed a lease with, with Russo. If you know Staten Island, and again, we're poaching Staten Island, but if it works, it works. Angelina's is a very high-end restaurant in, in Staten Island. You probably can't get out of there without 200 bucks a head. Um, Angelina's Kitchen is owned by her son in Staten Island, and it's a very casual version of that that caters to families, caters to kids. They have wonderful events, wonderful shows, wonderful things going on, and we convinced them to open up their second restaurant in Woodbridge. So I cannot wait for Angelina's Kitchen. People are absolutely going to love it, and it's going to be right on the pad across from Wegmans where Vermilla is. Route 9 and Main Street has a huge construction project because of all that's going on, and I want to thank Governor Murphy uh, who gave, and the DOT Commissioner Scacchetti, who gave us a $12 million grant to work on that project. They're redoing both lights, one at the Bowling Alley uh, for Route 9 South and one at Venezia Nolan for Route 9 North. Those two intersections are going to be upgraded and synchronized with a new light right outside Wegmans where the Wells Fargo is, and that's going to go into the Vermilla development. It's a terrific project, and it's all paid by the state of New Jersey. This is my favorite one. So way back in 19, um, I'm sorry, 2007, we had our first Wet Coast seminar, and Bill Northgrave is in the third row now. That day he was in the first row. And as I looked at things like this former High Hill Garage, and I said, that's a piece of junk. We're tearing it down. We're getting rid of it. I don't, I don't care what it takes. And he was cringing in the front row because, let's face it, somebody owns that, right? And to them, it's you know an income property or it's something, their family business, who knows, and here I am trashing the hell out of it. Um, but I said, look, Bill, don't worry. If we get sued, you're going to you know, defend me and make a lot of money. So it's OK, whatever I say. But that, <clears throat> that was terrible. And now it's uh, a Northfield Bank, and now it's a daycare center. So that's another example. It's older. We did that quite a while ago. But it was kind of the start of the whole Main Street redevelopment. Upper Main Street, the community center used to have that right across the street, a Quickie Mart. You don't need a Quickie Mart on your Main Street. It had the old Bally's Fitness Center that had been closed for a long, long time. The Quickie Mart became investors, and the Bally's became another kidney center. The marina is an amazing project that we're really thrilled with. So we always owned 28 slips at the very end of Smith's Creek. And we owned a whole bunch of land there. We put a dog park there years ago. Uh, in, the late, in late 2019, we bought Captain Hook's Marina uh, for $1.95 million. And then we bought Pirate's Cove Marina, which was in awful shape, for literally $144,000. So we got them both for a little over $2 million. We're doing a major project there that will give us 77 boat slips. We're building a tiki bar for 150 seats right on the site. In fact, it's hard to see, but on the map on the upper left, you see a triangle that's a peninsula heading into the water. So there'll be a rooftop, uh, not a rooftop, a, um, a tiki bar with views of the water. It'll be fantastic. There'll be parking, plenty of parking. There'll be boat storage for the winter. You can see that new upgraded dog park. We're tripling the size of it. We have walkways. We have all kinds of great things. And we were going to do a restaurant. Uh, a couple stories, but you have to raise a restaurant 16 feet in the air to be if you're in a flood zone. So the cost is pretty astronomical. So what we decided to do instead is just have a wide open area and rotate food trucks. Everybody loves food trucks. We don't pay anything for them. We don't have to do any infrastructure. They just show up, they sell their stuff, and they go home. So we decided that's what we want to do. You'll be able to get your drinks at the bar. There'll be TVs. There'll be all kinds of you know, game amenities, and there'll be the food trucks. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Heather Lamont is in the audience. She is running that project and doing a terrific job with it. We have one of the worst sites in town was right here. On the left was General Dynamics. When I tell you this ground was, oh, there's a, I love that picture of it coming down. Um, this ground was so highly contaminated, it was ridiculous. So we did a process. There we go. We can see it come down again, I guess. Can we? I'm afraid to hit this. There it goes. Oh, nice. Nice job up there. <clears throat> this was a, a, a terrific project. We worked long and hard. We went out to, a, uh, to an RFP because the owners just couldn't get it done. So we did that for them. We selected the Halperns, Atlantic Realty, and they built this wonderful complex, as Tim said, right on the train. 
Uh, not as many cars as you would expect if this apartment complex was anywhere else but downtown near a train station. So that's great. We followed it up with this building and curtains, and then the other retail, Kumon, the coffee house, and Kessler. So this has been a dynamic project. It has led to downtown Avenel completely getting redone. Since this, Feed Your Soul restaurant opened, Soul Food obviously, barbecue place opened, Rocco's has a new owner and an investment, Sorrento's Pizza has an investment. Uh, Route 1 is exploding in this area. Dr. Swan, who's an orthopedist, to all our schools and has a big practice, opened up a gigantic practice on Route 1. There's a new dentist, there's a new psychiatrist. There is, um, whoops, there we go. Oh, that's an area view of where we are now. I should have put this on a little sooner. There we are. You'll see top left, the coffee bar. Avenel Pharmacy had a major renovation. That's the soul food restaurant, the pizzeria. Jersey Boys Pizza, uh, Jersey Pizza Boys, I have to say it right, because Jersey Boys will be a, tra a trademark infringement. Jersey Pizza Boys is fantastic. All this downtown development and Route 1 development has been amazing. Uh, the Greens at Avenel opened up a couple of years ago. It's 75 units. It's targeted towards special needs adults, which is terrific. Mom and dad need a place for their kid to go and be self-sufficient and learn skills um, when they know that they're not going to be around forever to take care of their kids. So that was built on uh, Rahway Avenue by the prison on a site that used to be the warden home for uh, East Jersey State Prison back in the day when they had to live nearby before phones and emails and the ability to work remote. Avenel residential development followed in several other different places. These are two of them. Route 1 has been on fire, as, as has downtown Avenel. Now, Woodbridge Center has a lot of good news. <clears throat> they uh, either sold or are leasing Lord & Taylor, which has been vacant for a while. Uh, it's got approval um, internally for them. We've taken some steps to make it a redevelopment zone and help them with that, but I can't say who's coming, but it's a healthcare-related use with 300 high-paying jobs, which is the kind of shot in the arm that Woodbridge Center needs to have those people with money at lunchtime and after lunch and the, the restaurants they have and the bars that they have and the shops that they have, it's absolutely terrific. Now, it's not gonna become a hospital. Some knucklehead posts on Facebook, Woodbridge Center's becoming a hospital, and I get 25 emails within 25 hours asking me if it's true. No, it's not true. Don't read Facebook, don't listen to Facebook, don't pay any attention to Facebook. Nothing is accurate on Facebook, <laughs> unless it's on the mayor's page. And um, the um, Carrie Teifel and his group has uh, uh, built the Lux Apartments there. They're absolutely beautiful. He's doing a second phase of that with some self-storage. He's somebody we love dealing with. So Woodbridge Center is going to be fine. Now we are on, let me get my place here because I'm talking without looking. Yeah, now we're on Route 1 in Avenel. You'll see Holiday Inn, which is also Carrie Teifel's. You'll see the Wawa from a couple of years ago, which knocked out Mom's Diner. Mom hadn't had breakfast there in 50 years. It knocked down an old gas station. It knocked down the Jim Motel, which I won't say my usual line, but maybe I will. You stayed there for 60 days or 60 minutes. Um, <clears throat> and now that's gone. You got Dr. Swan, you got the Bubba Coos burritos, you got the Smoothie King, um, a terrific project. That's kind of the same pictures. A terrific project is the Cambria Hotels. That's the old Star, which burned down, Star Motel, which burned down, the City Motel, which is awful, uh, decrepit and vacant for many years in front of that. When I was growing up, it was Fitzgerald's Bar. It became the spot. It's awful. And now it's going to be replaced. Look at that on the left. And now look at that on the right. And you wonder why people are investing in Avenel and Route 1, because it works. And they see it. And when one goes, the dominoes come. And they just keep going and going and going. And we couldn't be happier. So the, another piece of news is that the, um, what's so funny? I didn't say anything yet. You're laughing at the Adult Variety Center, I know. Um, <clears throat> that is, not, look, it's a business. Families make money on it. But it's not the m nicest thing in the world to have in your town. Uh, so they came to us. We already have a medical marijuana facility in town, which has been a great neighbor. No problems, except early on they had some 
uh, some odor issues, and the people in Miller Pontiac next door kept spending more time at Taco Bell than working. Um, so uh, they were grandfathered into a recreational marijuana by the state. We had no choice, but we didn't care because we liked it. But we only wanted one. We didn't want to be Colorado with, you know, uh, pot shops in every corner. But when we had the opportunity, when the owners of the uh, adult variety store came to see us and said, we'd like to open up a second recreational marijuana place, we jumped on it. And we were just there last week, not there, <laughs> but we were in the neighboring building, <clears throat> which, which, so here I am, I'm, where are you going, Mayor? Oh, well, me, Heather, Carol, and Martyr going to the porn shop. Uh, <clears throat> Except not really, because we went to the, the old lingerie building, which was an, an ancillary use to the porn shop. But it was not to you. I guess it, it is. It was stripped down and, and vacant. And we went in there and had a meeting and talked about what they're going to do there. It's going to be a wonderful facility to sell recreational marijuana. I didn't want a second one. None of us really did. But if it knocks that place out, we'll take it. So now there'll be one on Route 1 North. Uh, just down the street and one on Route 1 South. So it's going to work out to be terrific. And I don't know anybody who's going to complain about replacing a porn shop with a marijuana store. Well, I probably know some of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Grand at Metro Park has been another terrific project. They went like gangbusters. They had plans for four buildings. They built three, filled them up, and then took a little bit of a hiatus. And now they're just about ready to finish their fourth building. There are a, uh, there's a shuttles to Metro Park, which is terrific. They haven't put too many cars on the street, which is always a concern, even though it's really not a concern because transit villages don't have a lot of cars. There's typically one car for a couple, uh, and they typically do their life on the train. They do their life on, on, uh, on uh, door, uh, not, um, yeah, DoorDash, and they do it on, um, what am I looking at, Uber and Waze and those kind of things. So. Um, it's just been a terrific project for us, and the owners are, are great. Metro Park, as Tim said, we are the home of Metro Park. We were involved. Carol was on the committee that looked at the whole project. Um, we're concerned a little bit about the impact on traffic, so our main focus is to make sure that the traffic problems that are there now don't, not only don't get exacerbated, but actually get improved. And that's why we're paying close attention to that. And I think it's going to be the kind of project that will be good for the town. And because it's right on the train, there'll be some apartments. But I can't imagine anybody living there that's not going to have their whole life dictated by the train. It's no one going to raise a kid in Metro Park. Um, so we think it's great. And then right up the street, there is uh, a continuum of care uh, complex going uh, by Woodmont. And that's going to be terrific for seniors because they'll be everyday living. There'll be assisted living, and then there'll be a memory component, and it's, you can work your way around the complex, and it's a real good way to let our seniors stay in Woodbridge Township uh, where they want to be near their kids and their grandkids. I rarely talk about Oak Tree Road because we don't do much for it because it just happens. We don't have to attract businesses to Oak Tree Road. They come anyway. Malabar on the right <clears throat> is an international six billion dollar jewelry operation with 250 stores in the world and five, three in the US of A and I think it's San Francisco and Dallas and the third one is in Island, and the fourth one's coming in Chicago I think the fifth one's coming in Atlanta I might have those uh, cities reversed but there will be five of this company in the states and one of them will be here in, New, in Woodbridge New Jersey so that's a district that we do nothing for, I don't say we do anything, nothing for, we don't have to attract people to it because it's so good. Downtown Fords is getting some attention. Bob Paulus is going to do, and Wick Builders are going to do exactly what they did in downtown Woodbridge. They're going to knock down um, the Forge Theater, which we're about to purchase, and they're going to build apartments that are going to replace the bottom left, which is a pretty old and not too uh, attractive Olsen Towers. The people will move right next door, and then they'll build new apartments next to that where Olsen is now, and that'll bring 50 uh, couples uh, and small families downtown to Fords with money, which is what you need, and all you have to do is look at Woodbridge to see how it's working to know it will work in downtown Fords too. We're building parking at uh, uh, an old house we're buying next to the post office. We're also 
building a parking lot that's almost done down by the VFW, so we got the, the right, the middle, and the left all covered with, with parking for people. Our house has been a wonderful uh, program for special needs adults. The RISE program is a program for special needs students between 20, 18 and 21 who are too old to be in classes in school, but the Board of Ed is still responsible for them. When Hess was being bought out by whoever it was that got the hedge fund that got the, their, um, their terminals and their gas stations, whatever, they had this former training uh, center. We were very cooperative with Hess over the years. And we then decided, let's give it a shot. We asked them for that building on the right was their training center. We asked them if they'd be willing to donate it to us, and they did. And we got all that land and that building for nothing. So we spent a lot of money on it, and it became, to your left, this home for uh, special needs um, adults through our house and the teens and young adults through the RISE program. And Mayor Max Cafe is something they started. They work there, they're greeters, they're servers, they're cooks, they're register operators, they're custodians. They do all that and it's fantastic and they love it and they can't wait to go to work. And if you ever wanna get lunch and be smile all during lunch, you can go there and you will have an absolutely terrific time. So if you haven't been there, you really should. It's also home for uh, wrestling and cheerleading in town. Those were always the two sports that got the short and the straw when they gave away gym space. Nobody paid much attention to cheerleaders or wrestlers. So we decided that at night and on weekends, that facility would be something for them. And it's worked out very, very well. That is the rest of the park. It's got a, um, uh, le level playing field for baseball, soccer, and softball for our special needs young kids in the buddy ball program and others. It's got two volleyball courts, two pickleball courts, uh, a detention basin there, a track all around it. The building on the bottom left is a greenhouse. You see a picture of that over there to the right. It's a fantastic facility in town, and we're absolutely thrilled with it so much that we are building Cypress Phase 2. It's gonna, it already has a soccer field. We're building a smaller soccer field. Uh, two street hockey courts, one of our busiest leagues, believe it or not, is street hockey. We're putting in a playground, we're putting in a spray park, and some other amenities right under, so you go from one Cypress 1 to Cypress 2 under Port Reading Avenue, uh, and we really are looking forward to this. We just met on it today and we're ready to kick that off. Now warehouses. Warehouses are the best thing that we have been doing because they give us a lot of tax money, they don't require a lot of public services. Morris companies have the old Woodbridge Developmental Center that is um, that we purchased for $5 million about seven years ago. And then we bought, it was 51 acres, and we bought nine acres of land for $2 million from Conrail. And then we turned around and flipped that to the Morris companies after a very competitive process for 44 million in cash and a six million dollar piece of land in front at Premier um, die casting which they had control of because they bought that in anticipation of giving it to us for a school so that transaction probably historically is one of the best ever in woodbridge township when you buy something for seven and flip it for over six to over 50 and we're going to wind up with a two million square foot warehouse that's absolutely terrific and the Morris company is a great company to deal with. This project all by itself paid for an $87 million referendum between the money we made on the, the flip, which was around 40 something million dollars, and the money we're gonna get from the taxes over 30 years on this building of two million plus a year and growing, that alone paid for the $87 million referendum. So we got out of it, we were gonna get, and I'll get into a minute, get into it in a minute, a new, $35 million school on the site of that premier die casting, plus all kinds of improvements, uh, two major school expansions in Fords and in Sea Warren, uh, connection of buildings that were separated in building pods, not coordinated. We got better uh, security, we got better technology, all kinds of you know air conditioning and boilers and just really bringing the schools uh, up to date and it's worked out absolutely fantastically for us. So now pilots, I'm gonna talk about pilots real quick. We do these payments in lieu of taxes. Most towns don't, most towns are afraid of them. We've been doing them since 1999. When I was a town CFO, we had four of them done. And then for the ensuing period while we were in Trenton, nothing was done. 
from an economic development standpoint, really. So we got back when we got, we got back here, we brought them back and we started them again. Our budget right now has $22 million in pilot payments in it, 22 million. Dividing it into our, our tax base, that's $525 per house in Woodbridge Township. Every house doesn't pay $525 in taxes because we have those pilots coming in from all these projects. In three years, it'll be 30 million and $700 million a house. It's working out great for us. In the entire time since we've been doing this, not one person from the school district administration, not one member of the Board of Education has said anything about it because since the very beginning, we've made the school district our partner in this whole process. So when we built warehouses, they have no burden whatsoever on the school district. Nonetheless, we dedicate 25% of what we make on the pilots to the school district. So for years in 2014, 15, 16, we built, and I'll get into that later on, uh, turf fields, we did all kinds of things for them to the point of them saying this works for the township. Further warehouse projects in Port Reading, there's almost 3 million square feet in several different buildings. Probably one of our top five taxpayers. Amazon, well, everybody knows there's Amazon everywhere. If there's, there's trucks everywhere, there's vans everywhere, and there's warehouses everywhere. And we have four different Amazon facilities in Woodbridge, and frankly, we're thrilled with it. Other warehouses on Paddock Street in Avenel, right where Morris is working, one of them back there is an Amazon warehouse. Arizona Ice Tea is a few years old now, but that's a great project because it's manufacturing jobs. Nobody was building manufacturing in Woodbridge, in, in New Jersey really for many years. This is a terrific project for us. It has high paying jobs in that facility. They make the tea there, they make cans and bottles there, uh, they have a lot of high-end technology, and they've been a great, great partner for the township of Woodbridge. CPV is very controversial now. So CPV1, right in 2008, we were here about a year and a half, and the people came to us and said, we want to put a power plant in Woodbridge. We've identified a site. There was the state of New Jersey was looking for three, and they had 20 um, sites, 20 towns interested. It was a very competitive process. So we worked with CPV. We designed a tax pro uh, uh, program through the payment in lieu of taxes, and they were able to use that reduced number in their modeling, and that got them the job. That got them one of those three facilities. The site they were on was radioactive. Radioactive. So we made a, an agreement with them that not only would we support the first phase, which was a gigantic power plant, but we would support phase two when the time came, and the time then means the market has to work for electricity and the financing has to work for the project to, to pencil out. It hasn't happened yet, but we're moving very speedily ahead with it. And now we're getting a lot of pushback, not from our residents, not from our elected officials, but from town councils and boards of education all over Middlesex County who think it's okay for them to tell us what to do. Now we would never ever think of telling a neighboring town or a town that's not our neighbor, a town anywhere, what they should be doing with their projects, what they should be doing with their taxes, what they should be doing in their towns. We never would. But yet we've gotten resolutions from, I don't want to mention all the towns, but six or seven different places telling us they don't want the power plant. First of all, the plant now is the cleanest plant in the state of New Jersey, uh, if not one of the cleanest in the country. And the plant we're going to build now, uh, 15 plus years later, is going to be even more um, uh, economical and more efficient. And by the way, even if you want to go away from fossil fuels between now and 2050, you need a bridge. You need something to do to take care of all your electric needs in the meantime. And that's what this power plant will do. But the bottom line is it cleaned up a radioactive site. And they complain about the particles that might be in the air from the power plant. How about the particles that might blow in the air from radi radioactive materials that were there in the ground and in the air. So don't tell us what we should do with our town. We know our town better than anybody else. We're not gonna bother you with what you're doing. Don't bother us with what we're doing because we know what we're doing. The other benefit to that pro project, it's on 100 acres, it's the perfect marriage between economic development and environmental protection. We're gonna wind up with uh, kayaking and boating and a whole waterfront park and bird stations and 
all kinds of great things there uh, as a split. So half the project became developed, the other half the project became environmentally protected. So it's worked out absolutely terrific. So just in general, now this is not specifically economic development, but if you don't do these kind of things for your people, uh, you won't have a, a, a town you can call the best around. We have six different senior centers. Sycamore, we took over a, the Port Reading Knights of Columbus. We left them have the upstairs for their bar. We took over their hall. It's wonderful. Evergreen's been here since long before I was involved in the town back in 1992 in Colonia. The Hickory Senior Center top right is in Fords. It took over the old Fords First Aid Squad. The Avenel on the bottom left, Maple Tree, is the uh, Avenel Knights of Columbus. We rent that. The middle on the bottom is five branches. We took over the Island American Legion. We left them a couple of rooms for their meetings and their events. And the bottom right is the Island Knights of Columbus that we also rent. So any place where there's an entity that no longer needs their facilities, uh, between us and the school board, we will do something absolutely to find a township use for them. Senior transportation has been terrific. They had to convince me to do this. Frankly, when the county did it, <clears throat> There was a lot of complaints, uh, and I didn't want to get into it. I didn't want the headache of it, but I didn't realize to my fault that we do things better than others, and we put the right people on this, and we now have eight buses, and the seniors absolutely love it. It's been terrific for us, and I think we started with three buses. We're up to eight. We probably need two more. This is Red Oak Manor. This is what Bob Paul has built for the seniors in, in Stern Tower. They moved to that wonderful facility instead of the concrete jungle that they were living in in Stern Tower. This is Delina Manor. We took over the Hope Lawn VFW. We left them a couple rooms in a brand new building and have wonderful apartments for seniors. Reinhardt Manor is now, uh, was formerly school two and school 16. You can see what that looked like. It's been vacant for 20 years. We took that over and made it into other new senior housing. So the seniors have centers, they have busing, and they have housing, not to mention the amazing programs that we have for them. <clears throat> we did the high school fields for the school district. We now have nine different turf fields. Every high school has new tennis courts, a new track. We have cricket fields in Avenel. Uh, we have auditorium uh, seating we did. We have um, gym floors that we did. We're allowed to do school improvements and bond it if they have community appeal and community use. We can't bond for a roof. We can't bond for a, um, other things. Um, we can pay directly, but we can't bond for them. So we started this whole process off by investing in the infrastructure, and we have, I think, the best facilities now of any uh, school district around. In the very first referendum in 2017, which we are paying for with all the downtown projects, Ross Street Elementary School is brand new. Look at the school to the top left. It was over 100 years old and look at the school everywhere else with a beautiful center courtyard. It's stunning, absolutely stunning, paid for by development projects, not by taxpayers in Woodbridge Township. Woodbridge Middle School is still up there. It's an old building. It was very nice looking from the outside, so we didn't do anything with it except expand on it to the left and to the right and make a practically brand new Woodbridge Middle School. These are other school projects we've done. I talked about uh, school 28 in Seawarren, School 25 in Fords, uh, School 22 in Colonia all have major improvements. We have a relationship with the Board of Ed that no other town has. We just love working with them. Um, we always say, you educate the kids, we'll do everything else. So we do, obviously, the garbage, the snow plowing, the paving of their lots. Uh, we do their computer work. We uh, hire all the custodians to clean the schools. All that stuff we have in a relationship with the school board that, like I said, is unmatched anywhere else. This is just an example of the things we have, exercise equipment for adults and kids all over our parks, a beautiful wildlife preserve, a Girl Scout park on the bottom right, a bike share program. We put bikes in three different parks and it was so popular, now they're in 10 and probably in the spring we'll have several more. It's just been absolutely uh, terrific. The Barron Arts Center is a very hidden gem in Woodbridge Township. It's been there forever. It's an old, I think, the first library ever in town. That's what it looked like next door, an old decrepit house. And we, not, we bought that, knocked it down, and made parking. And it's just an absolute uh, thrill to have that in our town, along with the uh, art gallery. They're two terrific resources. Our community center, we was built in 
Uh, started in 1999, it opened in 2002. Uh, that was a project when we were here in the late 90s, we went out for a proposal to develop an old landfill. There's a 15 acres of land on an old landfill. If you grew up in Woodbridge, you probably have milk cartons uh, decomposing right below that community center. Um, it's been fantastic. And again, just like, who's laughing? That's Stig, who's laughing? Who thought that was funny? Something wrong with you. Um, we um, went out to the bid and had a company come in and then fall apart as they were building it. So we took it over and turned it into the community center. And just like here and just like curtains, it was killing it before COVID and is now just starting to uh, recover. We purchased the club at Woodbridge in, on October 1st, 2018. We are spending a lot of money renovating that. We knocked out the tennis courts and put in an ice rink. And when you have two ice rinks across the street from each other, you can attract tournaments all over the East Coast. We'll come and come to Woodbridge because of our hotel structure, our re uh, restaurant structure, the fact that all the highways cross in Woodbridge, and the fact that we have two rinks, they're busy all the time with kids playing ice hockey. We have um, improvements being made all through the building. We just signed Geo Baker from Rutgers University fame. He's opened up a basketball camp here in Woodbridge. We have another guy from town who uh, pitched in Montclair, opening up a pitching camp, and we're hoping to get all that kind of stuff for our kids uh, because every parent thinks their kid's gonna go to the pros and we're gonna take their money until they realize they're not. <laughs> we have, I'm sorry, just a, just a sample of our parades. Um, Irish parade, veterans parade, holiday parade. The coolest thing we've done is John Mitch's idea in the front row here, our clerk. The middle bottom is the light parade where all our emergency vehicle trucks and public works trucks and army trucks come out the Saturday after Thanksgiving and have a light parade all through each, ten, each of the 10 sections in town. It's spectacular. <clears throat> the kids absolutely love it. When we did it two years ago, right after the height of COVID, it was a, such a welcome relief for people to have something to do with their families uh, when, that, when those trucks went by, a long line of probably 15 minute line of trucks going by and you had kids holding up, thank you first responders. It was just unbelievable. Uh, so those are the kind of things we do that make living in Woodbridge, I think, so very cool. <clears throat> we bought the Springwood Swim Club because we could. Um, <laughs> we bought the development rights to it many years ago with a township grant. Like all other businesses like that, they, the board, they had a couple of people doing all the work. They couldn't keep it up. So we purchased the seven acres for $250,000. We, um, the pool was in very good shape. So we opened that straight up, no problem. We started working on building a new pavilion. We're putting in a miniature golf course. We're putting in a spray park. Um, and it's gonna be, again, a tremendous asset. They doubled the membership from the year earlier to this year, even though we didn't have any of those amenities done. So I can't imagine what it's gonna be like uh, next year. With that and Highland Grove and Fords, we now have four pools, two outdoor and two indoor, one at the club and one at the community center. This has been a fantastic purchase. Our summer concert series are unmatched anywhere. Uh, I can't say we're the music capital of New Jersey because there is uh, New Brunswick, there is Asbury Park, but we are the free concert capital of New Jersey. We had 60 free shows last year in Woodbridge. Doo-wop, rock tribute, eclectic, uh, country, bar bands, uh, jazz, you name it. We had 60 free shows and the people in town love it and the people come from all over. When I walk around, hand down out the uh, flyers, I talk to people and probably half the people who come to them are not even from Woodbridge. And that's the um, end of the presentation. What I wanna leave with you is that if you have, if you are a client, if you are a developer or you're an attorney or you're um, an architect or engineer representing developers, like Tim said, we don't have much land left. Anything that's done now is probably gonna be taking something that's there and knocking it down and redeveloping. And there are a lot of old warehouses, there are a lot of old structures, there are some opportunities where people can come in and find those, find those places. If you have an idea, I recommend you call us first. Uh, we're happy to give people tours. I can't, I can't remember or can't even think of how many dozens of tours the three of us have done over the years showing people what's available. Um, I didn't mention a lot of projects. We have a huge project in Sea Warren um, at the old Penval site. We have a huge project in uh, Caseby at the old Jim Tempo site. 
Uh, we're looking at, there's offshore pro wind programs coming up and we're right on the water and we have opportunities there because of our location. We have a lot happening in Woodbridge Township. I wanna thank the employees who make that possible. I wanna thank Carol in her job, who's also the chief of staff and has a lot of uh, responsibilities there, but running the redevelopment agency, she's done absolutely a fantastic job. Marta's her partner uh, doing the um, planning side and the business side, making sure inspections are done, making sure uh, permits are issued, making sure the process goes uh, as it should. I mentioned Heather is other kind of people here. Tommy Kelly in the back is our building inspector. Tony Tort is our zoning officer. They all work very hard to make sure this stuff goes smooth. It's easy to do business in Woodbridge Township. And you all know that if you've been here. Technical review in advance, sit down, go over all the details so that by the time you get to the board, you have a very short meeting and they're looking at variances and they're only looking at what's important and not worrying about where the dumpster is or what wattage the light is. That stuff is all done in advance by these people, so it's terrific. I wanna thank uh, Vito and Casey, our administrator and deputy, and all the department heads who keep the business of Woodbridge running so that people know they've got great services. We have the best garbage collection. We have the best snow removal around. We have the best police department, bar none, because we know that because we're rated every three years um, uh, by companies that come in from the uh, all over the country to evaluate us. We know that we have a terrific government, and I want to thank all the people in this room who make that possible. And finally, the town council. Uh, in our form of government, there's not a whole lot I can do by myself as the mayor. Pretty much everything from the budget to paying bills to um, uh, approving uh, projects and pilots and all that happens only because the town council has bought into the vision and agrees with what we're doing. So I have to thank the town council as uh, as a partner in this entire effort. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Uh, I was gonna do questions and answers, but you wanna get out and you wanna get a drink. So if you wanna st uh, stick around and ask us questions, we're happy to be here. Tim said he'd stay a little bit. We're happy to talk to you, but uh, we won't do Q&A now. Thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate this opportunity. <laughs>